This is the BBC. Hello, welcome to the podcast of Shortcuts. This is the beginning of the beginnings episode. The beginning of the beginnings. Like that, the Beatles song. This is the end of the beginnings. You know, on, I think it's on Revolver. You know, you know that whole style of that whole record. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed today's show. This is the start and what a good start we have made of it. This is Shortcuts. Brief encounters, true stories, radio adventures and found sound. Today, beginnings. You were either a small town visionary or a small town snake oil salesman. Which of those is most accurate? The sky is clear. I move my bed beneath the window and I lie here in the silent night watching the shooting stars. Where I'm from, the London Borough of Bromley, always felt like a very small C conservative place. Conformism was in the air. It hung above us like a conformist mist. And whenever I would try to speak to adults about my creative ambitions, the response that you would always get would be, you've got to live in the real world and be realistic. And this used to really frustrate me so much. And I remember being at work with my orders pad as a waitress. I wrote slogans. And the two slogans that I wrote were, you are allowed, underlined, to use your imagination, exclamation mark. And sometimes when you want something to exist, you have to make it yourself. In the first story today, the producer Jeff Bird talks about being at that same age, an equally frustrated teenager, where you feel so full of possible beginnings. But if you grow up in a small town, how those possibilities seem somehow for other people somewhere far more exciting. And what he managed to do, along with his friends, was to will something into existence. You know, we're in some crummy town... That's kind of the opposite of aspirational, I suppose, or certainly was back then. And you seem to be the one saying, come on, we can create something from nothing. We can scratch something out from nothing. A lot of the things that I liked were from the same sort of cloth. People just believed that they could do anything, you know. I just thought, well, well, we can get away with this. My part in Mark getting away with this began one Friday night 30-odd years ago at Raiders nightclub in Preston when he cut me off on my way to the toilets. Mark was a legendary and mercurial figure among those of us right-thinking types who were enthralled to the fall and the membranes and other such noisy northern bands. By day, he worked in a supermarket warehouse. By night, he was front and centre at every gig that mattered. And now, with a pint in each hand and a fag in his mouth, he was standing in front of me. Hey, Jeff. He said. Do you know that drum kit of your brother's? Yeah, I said. Can you play him? He said. Not at all, I said. Decent. Gonna be in a band here next Thursday. Fantastic. Mark had just been talking to the club's owner, who had asked him whether he'd come across this amazing new group called the Dandelion Adventure that was getting loads of rave reviews in fanzines up and down the land. Heard of them? Mark had replied. I'm their singer. He wasn't the band singer, because there wasn't any band. In fact, the whole thing was a figment of Mark's imagination. All those reviews for all those fanzines were written by him under a whole range of pseudonyms, mostly lifted from the names of Harry Dean Stanton characters. And now, here he was, without any songs, without any lyrics, without any bandmates, being booked to play a gig the following Thursday night. The flyer said that uh, the band, the Dandelion Adventure, were a cross between the Jesus and Mary Chain and Pink Floyd. So uh, by the time it got round to that, <laughs> that weekend, I was sweating. I had no band. I had to start thinking fast and on my feet, and obviously I knew that your brother had a, a set of drums. So my memory of it's not quite right. It was fictitious, but it was booked yeah. previous to that night. And yeah, the, yeah. And, and the, I, I said I said that the band would quite happily play. Obviously, all the reviews in uh, fanzines right across were already out there. There was there was lots of good word about this band kicking around. So it was yeah. easy to get the gig. Oh, dead easy to get the gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were the band, and uh, away we go. So, after a few days of me desperately learning the most rudimentary of drum beats, I was standing in the club, trying to work out how to put the kit together. 
And while never having rehearsed and not having any tunes had seemed funny before I got there, waiting to go on among the hundreds of people drawn to the gig by the headline act, the fabulously taciturn comedian Ted Chippington, it was terrifying. I met the other two pretend musicians for the first time ever, just two minutes before going on the stage. Okay, Steve Hoppers, Tim Hoppers, Phil Hoppers, Snot Gobblers. It's a dandelion adventure. I remember my dad giving me a lift and I had a bass guitar in a carrier bag for a guy who was going to play bass, but he didn't have a bass. And I couldn't play anything other than Walking on the Moon by the police. I think all the guitar player could play was Wow Thing by the Trogs. The fact that I couldn't play drums seemed a virtue to you. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. Obviously I was the singer, but I couldn't sing. So we played, we were meant to do about 20 minutes. I think we played for about an hour and 10 minutes. No, it was longer because I had a 90-minute tape oh, right. and it ran out. Right, right, <laughs> so yeah. it was over an hour we, we, we were on for a long, long time. We, as I say, we never played. It was more uh, pre-jazz. You know? <laughs> so it was just, uh, but it, the way I looked at it was, if they love us, we'll get off after 30 minutes. If they hate us, we'll get off after 50. There was a lot of people that probably absolutely hated us. We had to start somewhere. So unfortunately for the people in, in Preston, I think they got the, the blunt end of it, you know, right at the beginning. We played without stopping so that the audience had less chance to boo, while Mark ranted on about Armadillo Tabernacles, Saigon, on the buses, and anything else that popped into his head. By the end of the 90 minutes, the crowd had gathered at the front, trying to force us off by chanting, We want Ted! We want Ted! We want Ted! Well, except one man, the great Chippington himself, who stood like royalty in his trademark teddy boy drapes and beetle crushes, shouting for more, more. It was the crowning moment of one of the most transformative 90 minutes of my life. Hello? Hello, is that Ted? Yeah, is that Jeff? Not that he remembers it, mind. Oh, right, yeah, I'm trying to rack my brains. I mean, I feel quite ashamed, I can't remember it now. Uh, I think I remember the venue, the little side alleyway. It was dark and wet and all the rest of it. As for your performance, no, that kind of DIY, making it up as you go along, all that kind of thing is what I did myself, really. I sort of like groups like that, and yeah. Up my street, definitely. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's something about beginning with no ambition, particularly other than just to entertain yourselves and lend some kind of meaning. Especially if you've got no intention of ever trying to make anything out of it. You know, obviously, you're not thinking, I'm going to be on top of the pops. If you've got that ambition to be a famous pop star or a rock star, chances are you're going to be fairly rubbish, you know. Just make it up as you go along. You're not particularly bothered what anyone thinks about it. You know, that was the sort of philosophy, if there was one, you know. And there was a philosophy, I think. A pranksterish belief in possibility. And hammering away at the drums as my fingers bled, I learned what William Carlos Williams had known decades before, that virtue is in the effort. I'd seen so many gigs where the bands could play but were rubbish. I just thought, well, you know, can't be that hard. It wasn't just the first night, though, was it? Because the, the next gig we played, we sent in a <laughs> tape of a 1970s folk band for a battle of the bands in Blackpool. Yeah. We sent in a tape with two bread tracks on it. and they were, Bread? It, it was bread. It was <laughs> a, knowing that the, the organiser of the battle of the bands wouldn't have a clue who it were, and uh, he put us on. And we won. Yeah. We only uh, won, though, because it was the, the audience voting. The audience win. voted, we took... and we took a coach. <laughs> we took a coach of people, yeah. You know, if only, if only life was that easy. But the next show we did, we played London, and the melody maker reviewed us and gave us an absolutely amazing review, which obviously we thought, this is genius, and we are on the right thing here, and we hadn't really put that much work into it at all. But then, obviously, after that, we did have to start rehearsing every once every three months. 
I mean, at the Dross, there's always a gem, as someone once said. Dandelion Adventure in session. That's called Exit Frenzy Revisited. The lineup of the band Jeff on drums to the left. We were together for three or four years, and we had our moments. John Peel liked us. So did the music papers. We did a couple of albums, which was, uh, which was great. Hey, Speed Trials! Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth once said we were his favourite British band. Only because we'd ripped off his album cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we were once supported by Blur, even if it was in the very earliest days. But in truth, by any normal reckoning, we were small beer, erased from any but the most arcane of musical histories. And that's fine, because we were never really interested in normal reckonings. Because virtue is in the effort, not the reward. And while we didn't end up huge or even big, at least our beginning, born out of forgery and playful deceit, was unique and oddly beautiful for all the racket we made. Too right. I think we did our bit. You were either a small-town visionary or a small-town snake oil salesman. Which of those is most accurate? I do like the idea of the snake oil seller. That sounds great. Pretending you've got the tiger behind the curtain when you haven't got anybody behind the curtain other than uh, someone with a spotlight and a good set of hands, you know, shadow play. I mean, the audience thinks the tiger might just get from behind that curtain and take some child's head. Yeah, I like that. I like... I like the myth. Dandelion Adventure, the last from them tonight. Seems that they sampled even themselves in the course of that. Jeff Bird and the Dandelion Adventure. I love thinking about his friend Mark fabricating all of these reviews before the band even existed, saying how brilliant they were. It makes you realise how much of making things happen is a confidence trick. As a kid, I remember being a little bit disapproving when the band Oasis came out and said, we're the best band in the world and we're going to be the number one band in the world. It seemed a bit American and overconfident. But now, I'm just really proud and in awe of that level of swagger. Because that's what you need to convince the world to take notice of you. Like, don't worry about reviews. Just write your own reviews in advance. Don't wait for other people to say that you're great. You say it in advance so much that people say, well, I've definitely heard it said. (laughs) 